My name's Rob Young. Um, I am presenting this talk on behalf of The Wire magazine, which is one of the media partners of uh, Big Ears Festival. We're very happy to be here. Um, and um, we are running uh, two other talks over the course of uh, the festival, one tomorrow at 11.15 with Jace Clayton talking about Julius Eastman, and another one on Sunday at 11.15 talking about Pauline Oliveros with uh, Alvin Curran and others. Um, I am very delighted to be able to welcome a man who I first met, I realize, 21 years ago in 1996 when I was working uh, at The Wire. Um, he got in touch, he was in London, got in touch with our office and uh, was interested in meeting up. Um, it was at a time when uh, the music which, well I wanted to avoid using the K word in this talk, the music often referred to as kraut rock, uh, but which uh, should really go under the much snappier title of uh, progressive German rock music of the late 60s and early 70s, of course. Um, that kind of music was really kind of coming back into prominence. Uh, a lot of reissues were happening during the 90s, a lot of, uh, some of the groups were reforming, uh, kind of coming out with reissues, um, or just continuing, uh, not going down a nostalgic route in reviving their old work, but just uh, plowing ahead with new and innovative material. And uh, my guest today is certainly one of those and uh, continues to uh, create new music uh, after an extremely long, fascinating life, which I think we're going to delve into now. So please welcome Hans-Joachim Rodelius. Hello. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thanks very much for, for, for joining us. It's great to see you again. I remember that, uh, that day in, um, in 1996 was quite a strange one because uh, we did an interview and then uh, we, w we went on to meet um, the English rock star Julian Cope, who had just written a book, a kind of fan love letter to German music. And it was a very strange meeting. It was a kind of a meeting of worlds in a way, wasn't it? Do you remember that? It was a weird meeting, yeah, because Julian is so enthusiastic and he wrote so enthusiastic about our music. But I have to say, to make a difference, I am a physiotherapist, masseur, guider of the dying. I am not a musician. And I approach music from the, from the art of healing, not from, uh, academical, from the academical-based uh, approach to music composition. So that's, I think that uh, it gives from the beginning a different view to in which way I work, how, why I work, in which way I work, and uh, why I became some, somehow famous also. <laughs> and you've actually, uh, you've written a book. I mean, we're, we're seeing a page yeah. from, your, from your book, which is called The Book, I believe, Das Buch, yeah. in, in Auf Deutsch. Um, and so is, this is a project which you have completed in German, is that right, or is it ongoing? The book is available in autumn in English as well. It's about 500 pages. It's a one kilo, 200 gram. You can't read it, holding it in your hands. It's full of information. It's not only about my, my life, it's also about what happened to me when I, were, when I went my way through the, around the globe. Many, my, my poetry is in it, um, statements, the political terms, and um, yeah, it will be available. It starts with, um, I, I, I want to read it to you, with an old wisdom from China, the golden age. In those days, when the natural work of the highest order still prevailed on earth, Wisdom was not valued and ability not called for. The ruler resembled a tree that shields everything with its branches. The people were like the deer that nestle under its crown. 
People were righteous and sincere without knowing what duty is. They loved their neighbor without knowing what love is. They were faithful without knowing what fidelity is. They were loyal without knowing what loyalty is. They helped each other in natural ways without feeling this to be a special kindness. Therefore, their deeds did not leave their mark and their works were not handed down to posterity. Zhuang Zi. I think that's a very nice, it's uh, bringing us back to what uh, I think America in the moment is in a very difficult situation because there's somebody who, who thinks he's a president. And um, I really think he is impeaching himself soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we can dream. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, th uh, thanks for reading that. Um, I mean, is uh, is at this point in your life now? I mean, you, you were born in 1934. Um, it's a remarkable uh, span, and to be to be still uh, active, it's incredible. I mean, even um, the uh, I, mean, I just uh, wrote a book about Can another. German group from that generation, but uh, I think even you're even four years older than the the oldest people in that group. So you, you you've sort of almost you had almost had an extra got an extra longevity um, in comparison to that that kind of that musical world. But is it, at this point, you know, is 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 this kind of poetry? Is that something that you take more? Is is that kind of your reading now? Is that is that where you're taking inspiration from? Chandra, can you tell me? He wants to know. You, you have to tell me in my ear with your voice. Take your stool. Take your stool. Take your stool. Sorry for that. I can't it's really hear important. through these loudspeakers. He wants to know. What language would you like? Oh, he wants to know if your uh, poetry is something that you're doing now as part of this ongoing expression of art. My poet, I, I always did poetry since I, since I became aware of um, that I work at the field of arts. And my poetry is more or less, um, or the whole thing I'm doing is more or less a diary of my life. Each day in a different way, sometimes in music, sometimes in poetry, sometimes in, in other texts. Um, for, and, Unfortunately, it's all in, in German now, and I think, don't think it will, be, it will be easy to translate it into English because it's all in rhyme. I like rhyming. Um, I mean, let's, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about your, your early life because it's quite an incredible story. I mean, you were born in, in Berlin, uh, 1934, uh, but your experiences during the war and afterwards, I mean, they're really quite extreme, you know. I mean, you, uh, yeah. you moved away uh, to the countryside, I think, as a small boy. And in your, I mean, after the war, you were arrested and imprisoned uh, yeah. by the East German Stasi. Um, could you talk a bit about that experience? Uh. As you said, I was born in uh, the Nazi time and uh, I became sort of victim during the bombings before the um, state evacuated it to a, different uh, to a different part of Germany, to East Prussia, where we went in '43 when the bombings really were horrible. And, and I remember, I still remember um, the horrible times when they had to go down to the basement when um, the bombing started at night. And then we went back, we went to, that, uh, to East Germany and we had to flee from there because uh, the Russians came and we, st we stayed in, uh, in the former Sudetenland, which is part of Czechoslovakia. And then we had to go away from there when uh, the, f the war ended just uh, walking to, we wanted to go back to Berlin, but it was not possible, we had to stay in the Russian zone. 
And in the Russian zone, I had to become um, a soldier. And I flew as a soldier from them because I couldn't bear it. And I had to go back because my family called me back to, to be with them. And they sent me for two years into prison. And I was uh, half a year, the Stasi wanted, to, wanted me to make a spy because he couldn't believe that somebody is so stupid to come back from Western Germany when he already was there. So, <laughs> but it, wa it wasn't inspired also, but they even thought so, and they got me to jail and they, yeah, what is the name, the, the, I was um, justified for being a boy boycott, um, uh, boycott head, sorry. However, I stayed there for two years and two months, and then my sister got me out by praying for me. And uh, I ended up, I had to stay in, in uh, East Germany, and they allowed me to become a physiotherapist, masseur, nurse, guide of the dying. And then one day they called me again to come to the Stasi, and I didn't go because I thought, oh God. I don't, I don't want that anymore and, and fled to West Berlin in 1960, just one year before the war came up. And then um, there I worked uh, because I had to, for my living, I couldn't, they didn't agree to my examiner. I couldn't be a physiotherapist there. I had to work wherever. And, uh, everything from detective to, to street worker and many, many different jobs. But fortunately, one day I could work as a masseur in a wellness center and I got to know people that were connected to arts and they got me to know the Living Theater when they came to Berlin and performed Frankenstein, and that was the moment when I thought, oh, I don't want to be a masseur, I want to, to be an artist. And so I became slowly an artist, playing on the street music with a little bongo, a bonga, conga, conga and uh, with flutes and belts. And I became, uh, I got friends from the art scene, and, and one day we, we founded the Zodiac Club in 1968. So then um, my, real, the, my, my life as an artist started at the Zodiac with Konrad Schnitzler and many other people. And... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely, yeah. We, we, I wanted to get onto that. I mean, just to back up for a moment, I mean, you just dropped it in there, but I mean, two years as a prisoner, I mean, that is a long time yeah. to be held. And it could make a lot of people quite bitter, you know, or depressed. But I mean, uh, if there's one thing that I feel from your music and your art, it is a deep sense of peace, I would say. Peace and um, in much of it, a kind of tranquility. And I wonder, were those feelings that you came out with from that experience of being a prisoner, or did it take time to reach that, that point? I believed in God from the beginning when I was a child already, without knowing that it was believing in God. I trusted my faith, and I always thought I am well protected somehow. But it was not, it had nothing to do with religion. It was just the feeling that there is something which guides me and protects me and, and uh, gives me also the thread where to go. So when I got into art and when I, f when I first uh, wrote poems, it became all, it became more, it became, I be, became aware of that uh, something that I have to uh, follow with full consciousness. And I think all what, I, I, I touched so many bodies as a masseur, I think thousands of bodies, I got to know what people think about life, their own lives, 
everybody was somehow different, not somehow, everybody was different. Everybody believed in something else. Everybody thought this is uh, the right way to behave. So I was, uh, in the beginning, I was really very um, mixed up because everybody was in a different, believed in a different way of life. And I didn't really know what to do with it. But it, what, this was a base for, for, my, for my own art. I, I became aware through all these guys these, who spoke to me on the, on the massage table that um, I have to concentrate on, on what I already thought about life and what, what I believed at the time. And it was always peace and love, nothing else. It was, uh, I knew that I had to do something that went worked out then the way it did. And uh, my body of work is about 170 records already and, and a lot of love from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. So you're in Berlin, 1968, uh, the Zodiac. Uh, free Arts Lab, uh, as, which you mentioned. Can you describe for me a little bit what, what would I have seen if I'd walked into the, the Zodiac Free Arts Lab in 1968? What, what kind of a place was it? What were the ideas being explored? It was a centrum of creative chaos. <laughs> Everybody who... It just, it just was necessary to, to found such a club in, in the 60s because Germany was left over with... with uh, Hitler did so bad things that nobody believed that ever Germany would go a better way. And we had to do something we, did, we didn't know about what. We just had to try to find something that... that um, uh, set a limit between the past and gave some optimism for the, for the future. And even so, what we did was not really uh, approachable because it was musical actionism. Nobody knew what, what he really did. We just tried to find out what to do, in which way, and how it would work to others, and in which way it would reflect us back to us. And uh, after one year in the Zodiac, we already started to become aware of what we did, in which way we did, and how we had to behave later on. So the Zodiac was closed in 69, early 69. We, the group that Schnitzler had left, and the group called Human Being, the five people, six, nine people, uh, uh, start, um, um, went on a, on a journey to Africa, to Morocco, because there was smoking much easier like in, in, in Berlin. And, uh, but we ended up on a parking space in Casablanca and, and split. Human being split in Casablanca and I went back with my girlfriend to via Corsica, France, London where we met people from the so, former uh, Arts, Lab. Arts Lab. We tried to stay in London, but it was not possible. And we went back, and then at the end, when we arrived in Berlin, 69, we founded the group Cluster with K, Conrad Schnitzler's idea, with Möbius and him, and then it step by step, Harmonia and all my solo stuff, and all the collaborations, and. The last collaboration is with this guy here. <laughs> Chandra, our good spirit on the tour who organized all that, what's possible now here in America. And not that, that alone. I mean, a lot of um, the musicians in Germany from that time talk about 1968, that sort of period, as a time when people were really thinking they have to sort of build a new German culture. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, sometimes it's a very political idea of that, but sometimes it's a more cultural or a reconnection with the pre-Nazi culture. And they're doing that in a, in a situation where I, I believe a lot of 
positions of responsibility uh, in universities, business, were still held by former Nazis. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's you right. still uh, are. And so, yeah, right. You still are. <laughs> and, uh, Everywhere um, on the globe. And they're coming back, yeah. Um, that's becoming cool again, yeah. Um, but uh, w was that a sense that you had at the time? Was it a, to what extent was your involvement in, in the music and the uh, underground culture of that time? To what extent were you conscious of wanting to build this new post-Nazi Germany? Uh, I was a burnt child because I was uh, involved in the political process in East Germany. I had to go to demonstration. I had to say Heil Ulbricht as a, as a young boy, and I didn't like that, but I had to. And I had to go to be a soldier, and I didn't like it. So I was a burnt child. I wasn't involved in the polit political process in Berlin. I was just in the culture, involved in the cultural process. I knew all the, all the guys. I knew the Commune 1 with uh, Bader Meinhof. I knew all these guys and uh, I, I hated anarchism from the beginning. I was, I'm not, I was not an anarchist and I was even not an actualist. I just had to learn about music, doing it by learning. And um, unfortunately it worked out well. <laughs> unfortunately it worked well. <laughs> Um, well, um, yeah, as you said, you, you formed uh, the band Cluster, spelt with a K, uh, with Dieter Mervius and Konrad Schnitzler. And this was, um, I mean, I had a little extract I could play just to remind people uh, what, that's, what that sounded like. This was quite a, quite a harsh, relatively harsh project compared to your latest stuff. So this is an example of Cluster with a K. Als ich mich nach dem Mittagessen hinlegte, kam der Tod. Er legte seine Hände um meinen Hals, stellte mir den Atem ab und sagte, so. hate to do this but I'm just going to give people a brief taste of uh, of these of this of these musics um, that's actually a 22 minute piece in total so um, I think we probably want to hear more chat than the, <laughs> the full 22 minutes but that was you know that's interesting that there's a text there right at the beginning and is that that's Konrad uh, Schnitzler no, speaking no I'm very proud of the two records we did first, Klopfzeichen, Knocking Signs, and Cluster 2, Easter Egg. It's, I don't know whether it's a real, ex, real translation, but two records uh, with a small edition of each uh, 200. And I think with these records, the two records, we really uh, invented the Neue Deutsche Welle, not afterwards. Uh, because we, uh, there was text used by, by, by writers, poets from the ecumenic movement and uh, it was the first ever popular music, popular, it wasn't popular at all, but <laughs> <laughs> people, the, the, the officials, the, I think they didn't like it a lot because because it was against mind pollution, it was um, against conditioning, it was just against everything what we have to bear now 
from, uh, from our governments and from our political leaders. So I'm very proud that we, we were the first who were able to publish something against the shit. <laughs> <laughs> It's around this time that you started working with the um, uh, amazing uh, German producer, uh, Connie Plank. Yeah. And he was involved in your next phase of Cluster, yeah. which is Cluster spelt with a C, yeah. which is the one that lasted had yeah. a, lot, a lot longer. Yeah. And that was much more you and Merbius yeah. as, a, as a duo, but it was flexible as well. Yeah. Um, could you tell me how you met Connie Plank and tell me a bit what, what kind of a relationship you had uh, working with him? Uh, Connie Plank was a producer of those first beautiful records, Klopfzeichen and Osterei. So we met him in a studio where our producer, the cantor from the church, brought us to produce this, this, this music, this record, and we immediately became friends. He was a very open-minded guy. And um, when these records were done, we met again in Hamburg. And because Möbius and I, we still lived in a car. And uh, we had no, no place to stay, and we had no money, we had nothing to eat. So Connie hosted us in his, in his home there. It was the Villa Kunterbund, where Udo Lindenberg and all famous guys from Hamburg at the time lived and worked. And uh, there, Connie was there uh, working in the studio. And so we did the two, the first cluster record, the C, and the second record, the C, the Star record. And uh, we got all, uh, every day we got deeper into friendship and uh, he was then the, our main producer for a long time until he died. A great guy, a really great guy, and a, so inventive, so inventive. W was he the kind of producer who would actually help you to shape your ideas yeah, if they yeah, were slightly yeah, unformed? Yeah, 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 so he took yeah, quite an active yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. yeah, He was a third member of Cluster, in fact, because he also went with us on tour this is mobile studio, and he, he designed a lot of our music, when not even on record, also on tours. Mm. Yeah. And he played also live. He played trumpet, he played drums. <coughs> and, and those first uh, cluster records, um, there's a lot of involving uh, long tape loops, is that right? They were constructed in, in a... Could you describe the studio setup a bit? Was it? I've, I've heard that it was a very long corridor, which you could have long tape loops. Yeah, that's what around. Brian Eno also did. He, he used long tape loops, and uh, yes, just to 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 make loops, of course. Yeah, sequences, which uh, that was new at the time. That was new, but afterwards, when Brian Eno came in the game and he worked with Connie Blanc on our two class and Eno record, we also use sequences. Here's a, here's a I've just got to just play something from that uh, first cluster album, just to.
Well, I'd, I'd love to let the whole 15 minutes of that play, but... <laughs> I mean, it's a sort of a cliché to say, you know, music that sounds ahead of its time. But, you know, I have to say, you know, there, you know there's music being made that's got those qualities now, I would say. I mean, I think it's a phenomenal achievement uh, that those early cluster records in terms of yeah. anticipating a way of thinking about music, about music that evolves over long durations, kind of texturally evoking a, you know, this sort of, this deep immersion in, in something as, as you go. And, you know, sounding with really, you know, kind of alien electronic mm. textures. It's a remarkable thing. I mean, how did it, you know, what, what was your feeling about that music at the time? Were you thinking in terms of creating something that sounded out of this world, or did it sound to you like a, a music no. of the everyday for you? No, we just did it. We like to do what we did, and uh, in which way we did it. Um, uh, it was our uh, given profession, in a way. We, we just did it. We liked it so much that we, we worked uh, 40 years together, maybe. Yeah. That's a long time for two guys playing together loving each other. <laughs> yeah, just loving each other? Was there, a, was there a sort of dynamic in that relationship? Because often in, in partnerships, there's, you know, there's a sort of yin and yang, or there's a, you know, different people yeah. bring different things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want, could you talk a bit about the nature we, of that we, relationship? We were totally different. When I, I never could speak to Mervius more than once a year. <laughs> We, we, we only communicated through music, it's true. We lived our own lives, even so we lived in the community, we had our own situations. But uh, to talk to me, as I talked, for example, to, to Connie Blanc, we spoke all night, we sat down and spoke all night. It was not possible, maybe it was a different universe and I was a different universe. That's a, I think that's the, the base why it worked so well. People say that about marriage sometimes, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, the, the, those, the, those early records, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting looking at the way you made them. I believe you were using different kinds of electronic organs and Hawaiian guitar is on there, is that right? And, and kind of you setting up loops and echoes and... and uh, of, of, uh, in the beginning... Konrad Schnitzel uh, provided Möbius uh, a whole battery from, from iron stuff, he picked up his microphones, and uh, then we went over to, to have each one, they had an organ, I played a, a guitar, I played a cello, Möbius played a knee, knee violin, and all these electronic gear, turn generators and machines which made nice noises. People gave us gifts of, of little self-made machines to make nice noises. And um, it was always very adventurous to, to, to work with it, equipment because we didn't know what we do. We, do. we just had to start and then came, came, or it came not. Sometimes it, it didn't came, come. <laughs> yeah, there was no, there's no manual for the, the kind of no, no. method you were using. Yeah, and that's probably what makes it so fresh yeah, in a way. Yeah. yeah. And so after uh, about a year of working in Berlin, you have this really important change of scene. You moved into the countryside in Germany, um, a place called Forst yep. in uh, Lower Saxony, which was um, very rural, rural Germany. Yeah. And you occupied a nearly falling down uh, yeah. old farmhouse, I yeah. believe, in the, and that's where um, Cluster developed and you were visited by uh, Michael Rota, mm -hmm. from the guitarist from Noi, where you also formed a, another group, yeah. Harmonia. Um, that period is obviously really important in your artistic development yeah. and it's paralleled with a lot of people at the time uh, I'm very interested also in the British connection between city and country and lots of musicians wanted to move away from the city and find the kind of new inspiration in the landscape and so on. Can you talk a bit about that 
that move and what it meant for for uh, your art at the time? For me, Forst was like landing in the paradise after uh, the evacuation from Berlin in 43. So 43, 53, 63, 73, 40 years of wandering, no, 30 years of wandering around over the, not over the globe, but over in Europe. No, no, um, really no quiet place to stay all the time with somewhere with somebody and uh, I mean it was very fruitful but landing there it was like paradise it was a beautiful situation beside the river and um, we had to, have to work to, to, to refurbish our houses to, 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 to make it comfortable for one year we only worked hard to, to make nice spaces for us, for each of us. And um, we had to go to the woods to, to, to bring the woods down because we had to heat our, our, our rooms ourselves. We had to, to, to bake our bread, bread ourselves, to make our marmalade ourselves. We lived a real rural life. It was a sort of, um, of, of gift from, from incredible value to be able to do something which never, nobody normally gets the gift to do that, to work really with his hands and to, to, um, to, earn, to earn the living, to really earn the living. So for me, it was paradise. And uh, I always sat at night in, the stu in our rural studio, which was just an empty room, eh? to work on my first self-portrait material beside the work with Cluster and Harmonia. And um, this girl came to our place on our way to somewhere. This girl there, look to turn yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, dared, she dared to stay with me. <laughs> Poor girl. <laughs> she really had a hard time with me. Oh God, <laughs> impossible. I'm writing it in my book. She is a hero. She is really my hero. No, no, I know. I know. Without her, nothing would have happened afterwards. Nothing. And that's a lot of work I did afterwards. And she's my moose, my she cleans my underwear. <laughs> the washing. <laughs> she's doing the washing. <laughs> she doesn't like that. I'm sure she does she, more than that. <laughs> but, uh, She's doing everything. She's doing a household. She's getting what? <laughs> she t she tells you the right moment to to keep quiet. Yeah, That's, she found me. In the <laughs> it's a very important uh, skill. Um, but uh, I mean, it's interesting that you know a lot of people um, now thinking about that um, German music. Uh, environment, you know, they often talk about the kraut rock scene at the time. Um, when you really look look at it, I mean, it's quite uh, separated, isn't it? I mean, there's you guys in in Saxony. Uh, there's Can, who had their own um, studio in a village outside Cologne. There's Faust, who had a kind of commune somewhere else. There's Amondu, who were in uh, Munich with their own yeah. thing going on. And it doesn't seem to me, having studied this a bit, it doesn't seem that actually there was so much sort of networks between these, uh, these, these groups that we now think of as central. It's quite uh, sort of separated forces, isn't it? Is that, is that who, did you have sort of relationships with some of, some of the other artists at the we, time? Even so, we were all separated. We met often on festivals or somewhere where we played. We met often. In the beginning, in the Zodiac, the Guru Guru came past, passed by, and, and uh, all these groups that were founded in the Zodiac, like Schult, uh, Michael Hoenig, Ashford Temple, A Tangerine Dream. Of course, in Berlin, we all were somehow together, even so we did different things. But then afterwards, for, for, long, for a long period, we, we always met and, and played together, and, and uh, were in contact somehow, even so we, we didn't share the same ideas. Everybody did something else. And uh, in a way, the, 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 con the, the really significant contact happened 
from outside of that when Brian Eno picked up on what you were doing. And you know, he was just coming out of Roxy Music, uh, really looking for a kind of new, new directions in music and, and just sort of really, he was very interested in what was happening in Germany at the time. And he came to stay with you in yeah. the farmhouse, didn't he? So that, that was a... We met him first at the concert that Harmonia did in Hamburg. And he went on stage to jam with us. We invited him to do that. And it was very nice. And we talked to him. We spoke to each other. And he said, please come to our place. And let's do something concrete. And he said, yes, I will come. And two years later, he appeared in us and stayed with us for, 11, for about 11 days. And uh, I think his first idea was to produce something. But it didn't work out because all day we had to work and we had not really time to, to stay together for hours to produce something. And he also went non-musicians. I mean, he was a non-musician as well. But um, at least... Uh, we did something together on the four track machine. Everybody had his own track. And um, he went with us in the forest and he looked after us and he enjoyed what he did. And he, uh, our daughter was bo just born. He took care of our daughter that we got more sleep, Martha and I, because Martha was breastfeeding her and, and we had today to work all day. So we, we really got tired and he, he wasn't tired at all. He was able to walk at night with our little daughter in his arms. And uh, next day, being awake. So it was very, very uh, impressive. Um, he went away with the tapes. And um, I copied the tapes before he left. Because I knew that was some treasure we did together. Nobody thought about releasing it because everybody thought, oh, it's four track, it's te bad technology, technology, it's badly recorded because he did it such a, a sort, sort of uh, very improvisational. But I kept the tapes and once uh, the new technology, there was a technology which was called, uh, anyway, it was a new technology which allowed us to work on that material. And I did it without asking them, the others. And it went out very well. And when they knew about this music, they agreed to its release. First it was, some of it was released on a, on a dance theater piece. It was used at the dance theater piece, which, which they agreed to. And then it came out uh, uh, equally in America and in Germany as Klasse and Eno Tracks and Traces. And then the interest increased. And it, meanwhile, it came out three times with some bonus tracks. And I think it's a wonderful album, uh, Cluster and uh, Harmonia and Eno. Harmonia and Eno, Tracks and Phrases. Yeah, yeah that was a real uh, a nice revelation when, yeah. when that finally came out. It's great. Um, 20, 20 years after its creation. Yeah. <laughs> First time. But I mean, the amazing thing, I think, about so much of the music you guys made at the time and, and, and you know, a lot of the other key German bands of that period is, you know, it really doesn't sound dated. You know, there's so, some musics you can really fix in, a, in time when you hear them, maybe because they have a certain guitar sound or, or the, you know, there's all sorts of signifiers in the music that say, oh, that's from 1972. But there's something still incredibly fresh about the music of that time. And I struggle to explain why that is. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at all. I can't on. explain why it sounds fresh. I only can say it's authentic. I think it's, it was always authentic. We never thought, we never looked after success. We just looked after doing it. And I think that's the reason why it still sounds fresh and still love people. Love. Young generations get approached to it. And I'm really proud of it that many people from the younger generations adore what we are doing or what we did in the past and still what I'm doing. There's something very um, 
wholesome about the fact it seems to have been built into your, that making music was kind of built into your everyday life in this place. Yeah. It's a kind of link to your whole experience of living, making a life in this isolated place. And the music is not separate from that. Yeah, because uh, it was never separated from our daily life. It was part of it. It belonged to it and everything, uh, every situation we were always uh, sort of white spaghetti cooking going to the kitchen from the kitchen into the studio doing something going back to, to the kitchen it was really it still is it still is more and more even more and more and so um around towards the end of the 70s then you and Merbius started to move towards doing se separate solo projects again. Um, and it seemed to be a lot of, I mean, generally, the, 70, the late 70s into the 80s seemed to be a time, not only for you, but also a lot of the uh, groups that had been successful in the 70s. It seemed to be a moment when things started to change and separate and, and find new forms. Mm -hmm. And some were more successful than others with that. But what, what sort of time was that for you as you, you moved uh, you know, into producing your own? You, you've, you've, over the years, you've done this series of uh, self-portrait albums, you've called them, which is yes. an ongoing. I don't know how many volumes it is now. It's at least eight, I isn't it? Ten or eleven. Ten or eleven. I mean, yeah. it's not and described uh, as self-portrait. There's Lustwan, which is a self-portrait. There's Jardin Fu. No, not Jardin Fu, not that. But gift of the moment, all these are self portraits as well. Mm. No, it started, my solo thing started already in Forst. And uh, we had to leave Forst because nearby, at, uh, up rivers, there uh, was a broken nuclear plant. And people got sick everywhere, especially Sylvan got sick on leukemia. And we really got feared, and we had to leave the place. It was a reason why I split with Mervius, not really but we had to go away from, from that place. And, but we stayed together, we, we from, came together for concerts. He stayed, he stayed for, he moved to Berlin, but he still had his situation there. Uh, his harmonia we broke already after three years, you know. And um, yeah, that was, his, we went to Austria and are still there. Why, why did you choose Austria? What, what, is, what was the connection with... Because uh, you live just outside Vienna now, don't you? And uh, what, was your, what took you to Austria as a, as a place to settle? We had to go somewhere, and her mother, my, my wife's mother, uh, always kept a little place for her when she, because she went from home also uh, when she was young to some other places. She was in London studying English and all this, and then... We, she was an artist as me when we met in Germany. She was a freelance artist as well. She made environmental art. So, where I am I? Where's my thread? I left my thread. <laughs> Austria. <laughs> Austria, yes. She, she had a place in Austria. And when we had to leave Germany, we went there. It was a very small place, I think. Where, 40 square meters with water outside and toilet. And uh, we already had one child in Forst and then she, there she got the second and third child. Uh, she gave them birth at home. I was some, at one of our children, I was a midwife because the midwife came too late. So we had the, the great privilege to give birth our kids at home was also something which is part of my music. Sense of the childlike, yeah. in a way, yeah. The sense of discovery is uh, something I feel yeah. from your music. Sense of possibilities opening up yeah. all the time. To yeah. have all this experience, this is, uh, it's an extraordinary gift to be able to live such a life, I really feel. Also, my prison, prison time was a gift somehow afterwards because I learned so much about, um, about life itself. Yeah, must have learned about survival yeah, and yeah. how to 
come through difficult times. I mean, as you said, you've, you've made nearly, nearly 180 albums, so you know, we haven't really got time to discuss each of them in detail, although I'm sure everyone here would love to go, go through all one by one. But um, uh, I mean, you've, uh, you know, and you've worked also with a variety of different musicians. You've worked with Harold Budd, for example. You've worked with a whole range of younger improvising musicians from Britain, Italy, you know, Europe, um, and uh, you've reformed Cluster. Cluster seems to have come and gone, uh, oh, you know, and still seems to. You've made a new Cluster, this time spelt with a Q. Mm -hmm. Cluster, Cluster. Mm -hmm. um, you've worked recently with the British uh, singer Lloyd Cole, which was quite a surprising one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me as well. The guy who did a perfect skin <laughs> in the 80s, which I remember well when I was a schoolboy. That was a, do you want to say something about that one briefly? Because that was Lloyd? Yeah. A strange yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> great songwriter, a great songwriter, a weird guy. We played together in life in, in Berlin three years ago or two years ago. At, uh, there was a celebration of my 80s year, of my 80s birthday. So we played together and uh, I, we learned to know how to, we learned to know him and he's, such a different, different, nice person, nice person. Lloyd Cole and I am now working with some of the guys from the Gotan project. This uh, mastermind, the rhythmical mastermind, uh, Müller. And I'm working with Christopher James Chaplin together. I'm working with this guy together. I'm working with the guy you know from Oslo, yeah. your new friend. Leon. <laughs> Leon. <laughs> Leon <Moralia>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, busy. yeah. You, you're still, you know, you have an incredible range of ongoing stuff, and it's, uh, nice. it's, it's challenge. amazing. Ch they challenge me because I have to learn a lot. I have to listen to them. They are all different. They have all different approach to music and uh, also different approach to living. And it's all. It's. Uh, I'm really gifted to be here on Earth. <laughs> well, we're very lucky to have you on Earth um, uh, with us. Um, and you've been doing a, a US tour now, and here you are in Knoxville. What, what, what are you going to be doing uh, during Big Ears, your, your concert? What can, what can we expect? Here and Big Ears. Oh, they, fortunately, they, they have a piano for me, because it's my main instrument now. And I'm playing in a church. I belong in the church, somehow. <laughs> Great, yeah. Well, well, we'll look forward to that. And um, your book, I mean, you, can you tell us the publication details it, about that? So you, you're, uh, that's available, and you're planning an English the, version. The, plan, yeah, we, the, the first 111 pages are ready. I think in autumn it will be ready when we come back for the, East Coast, for the West Coast to our channel show tell it. Yeah, we, the, uh, the tour for the Midwest and the West Coast is already kind of creating itself just as Occam's presence here, so uh, there's not much for me left to do. As much as I am on stage, I'm just as useless for that as well because his name precedes himself and his, his whole entire tour. So we're going to do a cross-country tour of North America and involves Canada and Mexico for September and October. So he'll be back. Come see him. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to celebrating your 90th birthday uh, in, in a few years. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, uh, Rodelius, uh, as always. And thanks so much for uh, speaking to, to all of us here. There's a riot starting outside. People are so excited. Um, good luck with the concerts and the rest of the tour. And uh, thanks to all of you for uh, listening. Uh, keep an eye on the rest of the talks program. Uh, some really good stuff coming up in the next couple of days. Enjoy the festival. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you.